स्वामी मुकुंदनंद जी इज ए वर्ल्ड रेनाउंड टीचर ऑफ स्पिरिच्युअलिटी योगा अँड मेडिटेशन ही रिसिव्ह हिज डिग्रीज इन इंजिनिअरिंग अँड ॲज वेल ॲज मॅनेजमेंट इन फ्रॉम वर्ल्ड टॉप रेनाउंड इन्स्टिट्यूट लाईक आय आय टी डेल्ली अँड आय एम कोलकाता ए शॉर्ट फॉईल आफ्टर लँडिंग ए टॉप कॉर्पोरेट जॉब ही रेनाउन्स हिज प्रोफेशनल कॅरियर टू ॲडव्हान्स ऑन द पाथ ऑफ स्पिरिच्युअल क्वेस्ट स्वामीजी इज ए सिनियर डिसिपिल ऑफ जगद्गुरु श्री कृपालूजी महाराज सो दिस इज ऑल अबाउट स्वामी मुकुंदानंद जी नाव आय वुड लाईक टू इन्व्हाइट हिम टू से ऑन द पाथ टू हॅपीनेस विच वी आर गोईंग टू इम्प्लिमेंट इन अवर डे टू डे लाईफ फॉर विच आय थिंक एव्हरीबडी कॅन परशू ए हॅप आय मीन हॅपी लाईफ ऑन दॅर पाथ सो लेट्स वेलकम स्वामी मुकुंदानंद जी divine souls i feel privileged to have been invited by the ign to speak to the highly competent professionals of the google corporation at googleplex and i do appreciate that you have taken your time out during your lunch to come and attend this talk of course this means that you will need to do multitasking eat and alongside hear what i have to say i have no doubt in your competence in your professional field whether it is it finance marketing or whatever however are you equally competent and managing your own life whenever i speak to managers i like to bring up the adage manager manage thyself when it comes to managing there was a very powerful concept that was popular in the times when i was doing mba this was called management by objectives it's not much talked about nowadays but the concept was that first of all you define the objective of the entire corporation and then break it up into sub objectives those sub objectives are then to be broken up further into different objectives until each person in the organization is very clear what his or her objective is this concept would enable the utilization of all the personnel the finances the resources the information of the company in the direction of the goal determined by it if we were to utilize this concept in our own lives our lives would then become more meaningful and directed in the direction of our ultimate goal so what is the goal that you have determined for yourself in life you are working here in google if i ask you why are you doing it somebody may say well swami ji it's a very lucrative job i get a lot of money think more deeply you are not working here only for the money there may be people who get more lucrative offers elsewhere however you do not wish to leave this company which has amongst the highest employee satisfaction ratings in the world 
well yes i prefer this job because it gives an opportunity for creativity somebody says there's lot of scope for career growth somebody says i like the work culture somebody says it's well paying if we were to consider each of these answers what okay it gives you scope for creativity but why do you wish to have this scope it will give me satisfaction happiness that means your ultimate goal is happiness or let us say somebody who is totally materialistic who says it's the highest paying job that i could get why do you want to earn money well with money i will get the things of the world that i need so why do you need these different things of the world it will give me happiness now the words all these different answers merge into one answer ultimately we are all looking for happiness that term happiness can be referred to in different ways somebody can call it peace somebody can call it inner contentment and satisfaction but that is the underlying goal of your life just yesterday on wikipedia i was reading about joshua liebman he was an american rabbi who wrote a best selling book that was on the new york times best seller list for many years this was peace of mind so in this book he says that when i was in my youth i made a list of the different things that i wanted in life i should have such a career such a wife such children such a house and then he says i went and consulted a wise person in my neighborhood to go through my list and give his comments on it whether my objectives had been defined properly so this wise person went through joshua liebman's list and he said all the items that you are cherishing are fine but there is one thing missing in this list what is that peace of mind and without peace of mind all the other things that you have mentioned they are all useless so basically all of us are looking for that peace of mind you may call it happiness you may call it bliss or satisfaction and everything else that we hanker for is because it will give us happiness can i ask you one question we have come to this conclusion that we all want happiness can i ask you why do you want happiness is there any reason for it Aristotle 2500 years ago had said we choose honor wealth and prestige because they give us happiness but we choose happiness for itself and never with a view for anything further i will come to the reason behind this desire for happiness a little down the line in this lecture however although we are all striving for happiness this entity called happiness still seems to be eluding us you have been running for it when you were a student you thought if only i can become a high school pass i will be happy you became a high school pass you found that that's not enough for happiness you thought if i become a graduate i will be happy 
you became a graduate happiness was still not there you thought well if i could get a job i will be happy and you got that job as well but still you did not become happy you thought well you know if i can be placed in google then definitely it will be my dream job and you came to google as well are you happy well you know at the level at which i am there is no happiness i have to go to the next level then i will be happy so this running for happiness is going on and on and on in this regard there is a very beautiful story in the puranic indian scriptures in the olden days there was a king he was walking on the terrace of his palace by the side of his palace was the hut of a poor family sounds of laughter and mirth were emanating from there the king was astonished that how can this poor family be so happy and i the king of the land am miserable he called his minister and he said minister what is the reason for the happiness of this poor family the minister said o oh, king i will give you the answer but it will cost you 99 gold coins the king said that's a small price he arranged for the 99 gold coins the minister tied them into a bundle and he threw the bundle in front of that poor family's hut now in the morning when that family woke up they found this bundle in front of their door at first they were apprehensive who has placed this bundle then they picked up the courage they opened it and found that there was yellow metal in it they were delighted so far we had only seen gold through the glass panes of the jewelers shops today we own this gold god has been so merciful let us count and find out how much gold do we possess so they started counting the, their gold coins and they reached the number of 99 they became discontented they said what kind of a number is this if god had to give us he should have given us a hundred gold coins you know like many of you would be familiar with the game of cricket so if the star batsman virendra sehwag gets out on 99 all of india goes into mourning for 2 minutes why could he not hit one more run and complete his century so this family decided that all right we have only 99 never mind we will earn the 100th one ourselves they may a plan every month we will save every day we will save this much now when they started leading their life in accordance with the plan the day they could not save a fight would start at home the wife would tell the husband you have not earned enough today the husband would scold the wife you spend too much it is all your fault so within one month the peace in the house vanished the king was again walking on his terrace when he found sounds of fighting coming from that hut he was again astonished such a transformation in just one month's time he called the minister and asked him what has happened to this family they were so happy the minister said o oh, king this is called the trap of 99 this family has fallen into this trap of 99 they are thinking what we have today is not enough to be happy because all we have is 99 if only we could have 
we would be happy. But this story, doesn't it relate to the pattern in our lives as well? All our energy and running is for that hundredth gold coin. Forgetting that we could be happy right now. So we are all running for happiness, but happiness seems to be running further and further away. The Vedas say this is like the Mrig Trishna or the mirage in the desert. The deer in the desert, due to the reflection of the sun rays, gets the illusion that there is a puddle of water in front. And to quench its thirst, the deer runs. But the more it runs, the more the mirage recedes away from it. In the same way, we seem to spend all our lives running, running, running for happiness. And yet we do not find it. So what is the proper way of becoming happy? To come upon this answer, the Vedas say, analyze your quest for happiness. Why is this desire for happiness within you? Did somebody teach you to be happy? Just like you had to learn so much to become qualified to be employed in Google. You went to school, college, university. Then you acquired the qualifications required for this job. Did you go to a university to learn to make happiness as your desire? Did you have to be taught? Listen, you must make happiness as your goal in life. It should not come about that you start running after misery. This instruction was never given to you. You did not have to be trained to embrace happiness. Everyone, irrespective of the country, irrespective of the creed, irrespective of the social status, irrespective of their different mentalities and temperaments, they all have one slogan. Give me happiness, give me happiness. Otherwise, there is so much of variety in this world. No two human beings look exactly alike. No two human beings have the same DNA. Forget about the DNA, they don't have the same thumb impressions. This little thumb has been filled with such variety that 7 billion people on the planet Earth all have different fingerprints. They even have different voices. When I came to USA, somebody rang me up, Radhe Radhe, Namaste Swamiji. I said, Namaste, who's speaking? Please guess. Is this a video conference call? How will I guess? No, no, guess from my voice. That person is confident that Swamiji will guess from my voice because my voice is distinct from everyone else's voices. We all have different voices. Not only that, our bodily aromas are also different. A dog recognizes through the nose. It's got a very strong nose. You're going to somebody's house who's got a pet dog. The dog looks at you and he doesn't recognize you. He starts barking. And when you come close, the dog comes to sniff you <laughs> and remembers, oh, this smell is familiar to me. I know this person. He's in my file. What I wish to say is that this world is so full of variety. No two leaves of a tree are exactly alike. However, in this matter, we are all alike in our desire for happiness. 
And not only that, everything that we do throughout the day is to fulfill that need for happiness. You have forsaken other possible activities in your lunch time to come and sit here and hear me. Are you experiencing happiness? Well, you know, just for my satisfaction, you could smile or nod and say, yes, Swamiji. But supposing I became terribly boring, what would happen? I have to get up. What happened? You were sitting for happiness. You know, this lecture has become so boring, I'm getting happiness in getting up. The activity has reversed, but the pursuit is still the same. Earlier, you were sitting because it was giving you happiness. Now, you are standing because it's giving you happiness. In fact, this pursuit for happiness began the moment we were born. What was the first thing we did when we were born? We cried. Every child cries. And if the child doesn't cry, the mother cries. Oh, it seems to be stillborn. Why did we cry? Because in the process of birth, we experienced pain. And by crying, we revealed our nature. I don't want pain. That is not why I have entered this world. I want happiness. You give me happiness. And since then, till today, everything that we have done at every moment in our life is in pursuit of that goal of happiness. And this is the universal common factor, not only to all humans, but all living beings. And in spite of that inherent desire for happiness, our pursuit for it over the last 25, 30, 35, 40, 45 years is leading to nowhere. So the Vedas tell us that the reason is you are not understanding where this happiness lies. You are running for it in the wrong direction. Like, for example, if from California, from Bay Area, you wish to go to Seattle and you are going towards LA. So you are getting further and further away from Seattle. In the same way, our pursuit for happiness is not in the right direction. So if we can understand where, why do we desire happiness? That knowledge will be very helpful to us. The Vedas tell us there is one supreme being. You can call him by any name. Different traditions around the world have referred to him by different names. Bhagawan, God, Allah, Ahura Mazda. One supreme entity from whom this whole world has emanated. That supreme entity is an ocean of unlimited divine bliss. Hence, the name for God in the Indian tradition is Sat Chit Anand. Anand means bliss. That entity who is eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma. This word Anand comes again and again. Your source, your creator, is an ocean of unlimited divine bliss. And you are his tiny part. You are his tiny fragment. The fact that we are his tiny fragments has led to this desire for happiness. What logic is that? 
It's just like the logic of gravitation. You have the earth and a small part of the earth, a little mud ball. Now this little mud ball is pulled towards the earth. It was always getting pulled, but Newton thought about it. Why is the apple falling down and why not falling up? And he discovered the law of gravitation. So this, the earth, by this force of gravitation, is pulling its little part to it, towards itself. Similarly, our source, that supreme creator, is an ocean of unlimited divine bliss. And our desire for bliss is because we are tiny parts of him. Now, in the world also, you do experience happiness. In your own different ways, everybody has their own likings. Somebody gets happiness from playing golf on Saturday. Somebody gets happiness by doing extra work in the office on weekends. Everybody has their own concept of happiness. However, all this happiness that you get is not sufficient to satisfy your soul. Why is that? There are certain deficiencies in the happiness you are getting from the material realm. <clears throat> Firstly, it is temporary. When you have that object, you experience the happiness. When the object is separated, the happiness goes so your experience of happiness is coming temporarily and going away. Like somebody says, you know, last weekend I had such a great time. What happened? Oh, there was this NBA game going on and I went and watched it with my relatives and we also had something nice to drink and eat and it was a gala time. And what happened this weekend? This weekend my car had broken down and I did not have time to withdraw my salary. I was just sitting at home getting bored, bored, bored. So that happiness went away. Right. So the Vedas say the happiness that your soul is looking for is not of that kind which will come and go. It is such a happiness that once you get it, it will remain forever. The American philosopher Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, had also stated the same truth. He said, every sweet has its sour, but divine bliss is beyond it. The sweetness of it cannot be tainted by the least tinge of material misery. Secondly, the happiness of the material dimension is finite and hence it does not contend you fully. Let us say that you get the promotion that you cherished and you reach a certain level. Now you look at the higher level and you say that person is ahead of me. Now this again makes you discontented. So the Vedas say again the happiness that will really satisfy you should be such that it is unlimited in extent. Plus, once you attain it, you have got it forever. That is the happiness of God, who is your source. Now, at this point, uh, we will be passing around a guest book. And if you would like to get some information from us about the website, over 200 YouTube videos and our regular newsletter, etc., then do fill in your details and we will keep you informed of all our further programs as well in this Bay Area. And we'll send you information about our uh, it, websites, etc., and we do keep the information confidential. So we'll be passing around the guest book and you fill in your details and pass it further ahead. 
So we have reached this conclusion that the happiness our soul is looking for will be attained from God. In other words, it is from the spiritual dimension. However, does this mean that we need to negate everything that is of the material dimension? Can we not experience that happiness while still continuing with our worldly duties and responsibilities? Definitely we can. That, in fact, is what is called Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga is a very strong tool given in the Bhagavad Gita for continuing with your profession and yet experiencing divine bliss by changing the consciousness within you. This, to experience that divine bliss, what is required is not a change in the external, but an internal change of our mind and our consciousness. For example, when you work, you do so in a certain consciousness. Somebody's prime objective is to get money. Somebody's prime objective is to rise higher. In other words, we are doing it in a fruitive consciousness and that is preventing us from experiencing the divine bliss. The Vedas say, change that consciousness. Do your work as an act of dedication to the Lord. When you change this consciousness, your work does not suffer in any way. You are doing the same things as you were doing before. But the change is internal. When you are doing it in divine consciousness, you rise above the dualities of success and failure. And you do it for the glory of the Supreme. If you see the history of the world, the best literatures, particularly in the Eastern cultures, particularly in the Indian culture, the best literatures have all been produced as an act of devotion to God. The most sublime architectures, they have also been created as an act of glorification of the Supreme. The most wonderful songs that were sung were also sung as an act of dedication to the Supreme. So if we can learn to do everything in that divine consciousness, then that is called Karma Yoga which means you do your karma and you unite yourself internally to that supreme. This word yog has come into the mainstream in the western hemisphere as well as yoga. There are yoga schools and classes and studios mushrooming in every city of every country of the world. And people practice physical postures and say, well, we are doing yoga. Some people say, I am a yoga teacher, qualified. But this word yoga, as it exists in the Indian heritage, is yog, not yoga. And that yog means union or to unite. Very simple. It refers to the union of the individual soul with the Supreme Soul. Now this union is not a physical thing. It is the union of the mind, the union of the consciousness. So to bring about that union, we endeavor 
to dedicate all our activities to the Supreme. However, this requires working on our mind. Just like people work on their body to sustain or maintain physical health. Somebody who is conscious of the old saying, health is wealth, along with their daily work in Google, they also take half an hour to go to the gym or to practice the yoga asans or whatever, because they know this is important to maintain the body. However, we simultaneously need to take some time out to nourish the mind. And that is our spiritual practice, tending to the garden of the mind. So the Vedas give us many tools to bring that about. For example, we have the tool called meditation. Now, you all realize that your effectivity at work is dependent upon the consciousness, your level of consciousness of the mind. If your mind is full of positivity, you are able to more effectively relate to your subordinates and your bosses, etc. So when the mind is so important, to improve our own lives, we need to work on this mind as well. And if we don't do that, then the weeds of negative emotions, they start growing in the mind and they destroy this garden of the mind. So the Vedas tell us that on a daily basis, you take time out and in that time, you Engage in meditation, engage in devotion, in whichever way you have learned or habit, are habituated to, to unite yourself with that divine consciousness. And when you do that, your mind will start getting elevated. And when that happens, throughout the day, Although you are doing the same activities as you were doing before, you will start enjoying and doing them in the spirit of dedication to God. And when you start doing that, you will experience the bliss of the soul that is within you. So very briefly, we have discussed this path to happiness. I would like to invite some questions from all of you. Anything that you would like to ask? Yes. Well, you see, when we are, we've got two different languages, then the problem is of inaccurate translations. So that is the problem that when you say anand, then you say bliss and happiness, it's all a matter of language. But nevertheless, uh, just since you have asked the Vedic concepts of happiness or the different kinds of happiness, so there are 12 levels of happiness mentioned in the material realm. And also, it's divided into three categories, tamasic, rajasic, and sattvic. So tamasic is happiness in the mode of ignorance. That is happiness you get from drinks, from uh, addictives, from laziness, from anger. Let's say somebody has irritated you, and you become angry and vent your anger, it gives you happiness. So that is tamasic. Rajasic happiness is happiness that is obtained when the sense objects are given to the senses. So that is happiness in the mode of passion. And then there is 
Sattvic happiness, or happiness in the mode of goodness. This is happiness when the mind becomes still, when divine qualities develop, when one starts engaging in the mood of service to society, etc. So that is, they're sequentially higher than each other. However, even that is not sufficient to satisfy the soul. And then finally we have the bliss. And that bliss is the bliss of God, which is unlimited in extent. So that is the happiness that we are striving for. Absolutely. The reason why we feel the need for happiness indicates that we have been created with this urge and this urge for happiness is taking us to perfection. Like you have toys, they are wound, the key is wound and then the toy starts moving. So similarly, all of us are doing various things. And the key that has been given to us is that desire for happiness. And the reason why that creator has fitted us with this is so that we reach that goal one day or the other. I am reminded of what St. Augustine had said that our hearts were made for you, O Lord, and they shall continue to remain restless until they come to rest in you. Now the Vedas say, Yo vai bhuma tat sukham nalpe sukham asti. Your desire for happiness is not wrong. It's bona fide, it's genuine. You don't need to feel guilty about it. Just try and understand where that happiness rise. Whom we call the great saints, they were also running for happiness, but they were running for it in the right direction. The Swami Vivekananda had said, these great prophets were not unique. They were men as you and I. They had attained super consciousness. And you and I can do the same. The very fact that one person attained that state means that all of us can attain that state. And that ultimately is religion. In other words, religion or spirituality teaches us all how to perfect ourselves to attain that goal of happiness. Well, people are so busy running that they don't have the time to stop and think why they are running. Okay? So, if you can take away this message, let me think, why am I running? What is my goal ultimately? It is to be happy. And then you analyze. Have you got happiness? Have you not? Why this desire for happiness? Where will I get that happiness? Forget about the answers. Just take the questions with you. I think that will be a strong takeaway. Yes?
Okay. Just like we are looking for happiness, the others are also looking for happiness. Now the problem is that their decision of where happiness lies may not tally with ours. However, if we can understand that they are also seeking happiness, we will have a more lenient and tolerant view towards them. And if we wish to help them, we can only enhance their understanding or help them find higher avenues for happiness. So in that divine light, we see everybody is looking for happiness, so we don't keep any resentment towards anybody. Well, engineers are habituated to think in logical compartments. I agree with that. That's why I try to make a logical presentation, a logical flow of this. Now, there is nothing wrong with having different objectives. I was just trying to take you one step further and to make you think that why do you have that objective? You cannot do away with the desire for happiness. That is my claim. It's up to you to agree or disagree. My claim is that nobody can do away with the desire for happiness. And I've tried to explain to you why that desire arises. If you can understand that, then you can divert your desire for happiness in more productive ways to make your life more sublime. But you cannot do away with the desire for happiness. Is there an exact time limit at 1 o'clock? It's still 1.30? Oh, I thought it was 1 o'clock. Okay. Okay, my own journey. You see, the Vedic philosophy says that we are all continuance as many lifetimes. So we have these sanskars or tendencies. So I remember even as a little child, I used to think and I used to meditate. I would get books from here and there. When I was doing engineering, uh, there were so many questions in my mind that science and technology was not answering. For example, we were being taught laws. But what is the reason behind the laws? In other words, if there is a law of gravitation and uh, Newton discovered it, that the law of gravitation, that's fine. But my question was, why is there a law of gravitation? If the world was created by a big bang, as one scientific theory propounded, then bang creates chaos. And we should have had a chaotic world. There would be no reason for laws to be in existence. But we find a perfectly structured universe full of laws, which made me believe that there must be some creator behind it. And there was no information in that being given to us as a part of that engineering course. Then when I went on to do MBA, now we were taught so many humanities subjects sociology and psychology and organizational behavior and economics. And in each subject, I was finding that so many different theories were presented. For example, if you wish to study society, you have one social theory, you have the second, you have the third, you have the fourth. None of them can claim to be perfect. 
they are only good approximations so this only increased my curiosity that what is the truth after all who am i and why do i want happiness and where is this happiness what is my purpose in life so while studying that management course these questions became very strong in the mind that was the time when i read the vedas the vedic philosophy and then uh, the conviction came very strongly that yes there is an absolute truth and then i started practicing that spirituality as a consequence of that practice the mind got more and more attached to god so i did complete the course and i did take up a job however that job was not satisfying because in that divine light then life had become more meaningful and i did not feel it sufficiently meaningful to dedicate all my energy to increasing the profits of a company i said if i do have to serve then why should i not serve god himself for my own benefit and for the benefit of the others so then i gave up the job and took to this full time it's been 27 years and i've never had any regret about it sure and how we feel this is also very connected to the desire for happiness just like i explained that the reason why we all want happiness is because we are parts of that one supreme being who is unlimitedly happy similarly we all innately love divine virtues honesty truthfulness justice kindness the attraction of the soul for these virtues is innate it doesn't have to be taught and if somebody says well you know there are so many people who are inveterate liars they may be but even they a person who lies wants other people to speak truthfully to him if somebody tells him a lie he objects this is called honesty amongst thieves you have a gang of dacoits and the leader of the gang wants others to speak truthfully to him if anybody says a lie he says you have the guts to tell a lie to me so we want truthful behavior from the others let us say a person is a thief he has stolen from somewhere and come and he is very happy that he's got a big booty today now he go- counts it and goes to sleep at night another thief enters his house and steals from there so the first thief wakes up in the morning he says what somebody stole from me does he not know who i am if i meet him i will not let him alive so you should be happy you are a thief your party has got doubled no i will steal but nobody should steal from me in all of us naturally want such behavior from others we want truthfulness honesty justice because these are divine virtues so that desire for goodness is because we want those divine virtues and the guilt is just an indication that we are not as yet where we want to be it is god's way of telling us that you still have to reach further you have still not reached your goal so it is a signal that is coming from the divine indicating to us that your present condition is not enough you need to do something about it just like if you put your hand in the fire the hand burns and you experience the pain through the nerves now the pain is not a bad thing the burning is a bad thing the pain is helpful it is letting you know 
that your hand is burning and you must extract it. Similarly, we all have this conscience and that conscience is telling us that we, uh, our original desire, our original nature is to be pure, is to be truthful, is to be honest, to be just, to be kind. And until we reach that destination, that conscience will not let us rest. Uh, you talked about uh, the names of God in different religions and the way in which there's a, a spiritual thread that ties all of them, all, all of them together. Um, but you also mentioned uh, yoga and how in Western culture we see these asanas or postures with the broader practice of yoga. Do you feel like there's a relation between West, Western religion and, and culture and your teachings in ways that um, are... Sure. Okay, just before people leave, let me announce that we have a program every day at the Sunnyvale Hindu Temple, which includes yoga, meditation, and the spiritual discourse. This is continuing till Saturday. So we have flyers there at the back if anybody is interested. And we also have a retreat coming up in the Memorial Day weekend. So if anybody is interested in participating in a retreat, uh, you can pick up the flyer for that as well. Yes. So you are asking about the, the, the comparison between the Eastern religions and the Western religions? Well, and, and Western, Western culture, in, uh, in the sense that um, it seems like we, we certainly, we, we don't actually seem to have the same objectives. Uh, we, we've converted some of the, it seems, it seems to me that, that even in some ways we confuse yoga with Confucianism. Right. So Western culture, it, spirituality is there everywhere. However, it is more of a materialistic culture where the goal in front of everybody is material development. And the Indian culture that I'm familiar with, that God is the center of everything, whether it is arts, whether it's crafts, whether it is dances, whether it's music. In other words, this was a culture where God was the center. For example, the Western culture, the epics that fashioned the culture in the Greek civilization were the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, these were mundane love themes. And the epics in the Indian culture were the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Now, these two are totally uh, immersed in God consciousness, two literatures. So we have this culture which is totally, which is more spiritual and we have this culture which is more material. So this yoga also is uniting you with God. So that has been pulled out into the West and the external yoga asans, uh, the postures are being done. Somebody is doing it for physical beauty. Somebody is doing it to keep old age away. However, the original idea of those teachings was to unite with God. So there's a difference in the cultures, definitely. However, I don't wish to distinguish between religions. All religions are taking us towards God. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you, Swamiji. So, lastly, on behalf of IGN, I would like to thank Swami Mukundanandaji to come to Google and have such an enlightened talk. And I think everybody would have enjoyed and everybody would have liked it. So thanks everyone also for coming over here and attending his session. Thank you.